been a long time as we've took the time to study verse by verse through the book of Daniel. You're in the conclusion now of the book of Daniel as it closes in chapter 12, but there are a couple more things that we need to learn on the way, uh, even in the conclusion. Um, Daniel chapter 10 began the last vision and revelation of the book. Daniel chapter 12 is, you're not going to get any new vision, although it's going to describe a vision, but it's the same vision of Daniel chapter 12, uh, 10. And you're going to see, uh, have more insight, more revelation given to you, but it's just continued revelation since Daniel chapter uh, 10. The vision giving some revelation and some understanding. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, the very first verse is kind of a summation and a conclusion about all the wars and conflicts that we studied in chapter 11 that concluded with the second coming of Jesus Christ. It says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be uh, be a time of trouble such as was uh, what, such as never was, since there was a nation, even to the same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now, we uh, studied last time, and we not only studied this, but we went into verses 2 and 3 and realized that there is a judgment that's going to come. The Verse 12 sums up all the conflicts and brings the Lord Jesus Christ back to earth and saves the nation of Israel, that is, those who were written in the book. Uh, there is a judgment upon the nation of Israel and all the world who have rejected Jesus Christ. And in verse 2 and 3, it tells us, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting content. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn to, uh, many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Shall we pray? Now, Father, as we continue to try to understand this passage of Scripture, and we need to review some and move ahead and to look into things about the judgment that will come upon your Son's return, Give us the spiritual wisdom that we need to have to understand these things and to understand maybe the part that, that uh, would affect us and things that are different for us. But yet help us to understand the truth that it's here for all of us to receive. In the Savior's name we pray it. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ returns and saves the nation of Israel and verses 2 and 3 make it very clear that in His return... There is a judgment. Uh, it's kind of confusing to me, and, and I don't think I have all the facts concerning this, but I'm going to share the facts that the Bible, that you can put together by comparing verses. And to understand, I think that maybe verses 2 and 3 are speaking about a special judgment. Uh, in the sense that in verse 2 it says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting content. You know, in Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 24, I won't take the time to turn there, but it talks about after Christ comes back and sets up His throne and the nations come before Him every year and appear before Him, and as they go out, they'll look, and it says, it says that they'll look and see the souls of them that, uh, that their worm will not die, and it says and they shall be in an abhorring to all flesh. It's, it's, as if a, it's a picture as if the nations, after they come to Jesus Christ, and then leave from the Lord Jesus Christ, after He is reigning, they are given a visual picture. Hell is opened up to them, where they can look and see those who are at, in hell, because that's the place where, the worm, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And the Bible says it becomes an abhorring to all flesh. That's that same word that you have here, everlasting contempt. It's something contemptible, something horrible to look at, something to think about would be the terrible, to, to go through it would be, would be a terrible thing, to even see it would be a terrible thing. And verse 2 says 
that when Christ judges, there's going to be some that are going to be raised unto everlasting life. They're going to enter into that kingdom, eternal kingdom where He is going to reign forever and ever. But some who are going to be raised are going to face that everlasting content. They're going to face the judgment of hell for all, for forever and ever. It's everlasting. Uh, when the Bible talks about everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, it doesn't mean that you get destroyed and you'll never be in the presence of the Lord. It means that you'll be, you'll be in a place of destruction. That's hell. And suffer there, being destroyed forever and ever from the presence of the Lord. You're not going to be part of His kingdom, part of His life. And uh, verses 2 speaks about that. You know, when you read about it in John chapter 5, and last time we were together, we looked at that verse, and it says, Christ says that the time's coming that all who are in the grave shall hear my voice and rise. Some, those who have done good unto everlasting life, and they that have done evil unto everlasting uh, damnation, or something like that. Uh, there's the resurrection unto life, and the resurrection unto damnation. But when it says, all that hear my voice shall rise, when we went over to Revelation chapter 22 then, 21 and, uh, 20 and, and 21 that is, we studied in Revelation 20 and 21 how when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, sure enough, there's a resurrection that takes place. But the only resurrection that's recorded in Revelation 21 that takes place, uh, 20, upon Christ's return, is a resurrection unto life. Blessed are those who are raised. Uh, on, on those on such the second death hath no power. After the thousand year reign of Christ, his initial thousand year reign, there is another resurrection that takes place, and it's all those who did not get raised in the first resurrection unto life, and they're raised unto resurrection, judged according to their works because they didn't receive the Savior and they don't have life. So they're going to be judged according to their works, and everyone is going to be damned and cast into a lake of fire forever and ever who are raised in that second resurrection, who is a resurrection unto da- which is a d- resurrection unto damnation, 1,000 years after Christ returns. Now, John said, in John chapter 5, Christ said, there's coming a day that all who are in the grave are going to hear my voice. But Revelation tells us later that the voice is sounded and the first time those that hear it are the living, uh, the saved, the believers hear His voice, and they're raised unto life. A thousand years later, the unsaved hear His voice, stand before Him, and are condemned, given assignments, uh, degrees of punishment, in hell for ever and ever. And, and so naturally it does when it says, all in the grave shall hear His voice, everyone. Do you realize every one of us are going to be raised from the dead? Every one of us are going to be judged of God. Every one of us are either going to inherit life or we're going to inherit damnation. Every one of us. You know, there is no in-between. Because when Christ said, all that are in the grave are going to hear my voice, it included everybody. But you know, I look at this verse, and it says in verse 2 of Daniel 12, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. They don't say all. And I'm not exactly sure this is talking about the same thing that John talks about in chapter 5 and Revelation teaches us about the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. I think what we're learning about here is in verse 1, Jesus Christ came back and He saved the nation of Israel from destruction. Michael the archangel stood up, who is the, 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 the archangel who stands up for thy people, Daniel's people, the nation of Israel. And when you come to verse 2 and it begins to talk about and many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some unto everlasting life and some unto everlasting content. If it was talking about what John talks about in chapter 5, why didn't it say all? Because if there's everlasting life and everlasting content and there's only one or two places to go and one or only one of those two judgments, then why does it say many? Why wouldn't it say all? Why didn't verse 2 say, All that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some unto everlasting life and some unto everlasting content? Because that's true of all, isn't it? The Bible teaches it is. But that's not what Daniel is dealing with here. This is not the revelation to Daniel about the judgment of all mankind. I think what Daniel's receiving here is a revelation of a special judgment that's going to be upon the nation of Israel at Christ's return. A judgment that scares me because... 
uh, well, just because it shows a part of Christ that I don't like to see. You know, we all like to see the loving parts. Maybe you're here. Uh, I want to share something. Aunt Gladys, in, uh, in, when I, in our younger years, was always the aunt that kind of replaced my grandma and grandpa on my dad's side. Um, they, my, my dad's mother died when he was 12, so uh, uh, he hardly knew his mom, and his dad died somewhere around the time I was born, so I never knew either of them. I never had a grandma and grandpa on that side, but Aunt Gladys is one of his older sisters. She always was our, she was our aunt, but she treated us like a grandparent. I mean, she bought Christmas gifts, always made sure we had new clothes for Easter and so forth. And, and uh, I share that with you only to tell you this, is one time when I was a child, I had a dream. And I had a dream that Aunt Gladys turned mean. <laughs> now, you talk about, you know how sometimes you can have a dream and all the next day you're troubled about that? I dreamed that there was a park bench and I went and sat down next to Aunt Gladys. She pushed me off and said, get out of here. <laughs> Shoved me away, treated me rotten. I never knew her that way. And I never did get to know her that way. <laughs> she never, she never did turn mean according to her dream. But what I'm trying to say to you is it's nice to know Jesus Christ is a God of love, isn't it? Amen. Someone who loved you, who died for you, who wants you to receive him, to know the good part of him. You know, some people are going to know the bad part of him, aren't they? Bad, and not in the sense that he's bad. Bad in the sense that they deserve to be punished and he's going to take care of that for them. They, return, they turn down his love. They love not the truth. So therefore, they're going to be condemned. They're going to judge. The judgment of wrath that's going to fall is called a righteous judgment in the Bible. And I don't like to see that part. I mean, I can talk about hell and... And, and talk about that, but to think that the Lord Jesus Christ, his part of it. Well, even, even with the nation of Israel, they were his special people throughout the Old Testament. Israel were God's people. They were born in a covenant relationship with him. They had some special privileges. When Paul lists the special privileges of the nation of Israel, he says like things like, to them were committed the oracles of God. They had the covenants and the promise. They had God. To whom them, concerning them, Christ came. He came to that nation of Israel. And they rejected him. When it comes time for judgment, because they had special privileges, they're going to have a special judgment. And some who are going to be raised at this time are going to be raised to everlasting life, the ones who received him. But the ones who rejected, neglected, as it says in the book of Hebrews, so great a salvation, are going to be raised unto everlasting contempt. They're going to be ashamed of their rejection and they're going to suffer that shame of that forever and ever and ever. And I think verse 2 is describing a special judgment that's upon the nation of Israel. Before I show you, and that's all I'm going to cover today, is that judgment because uh, of how it affects me and, and how we need to think about that. But it says in verse 2, not only is there that resurrection, verse 3 says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. That's the stars. And, and then it says, And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. You know, this is a reference, if you look back over in verse 32, that in the middle when the Antichrist began to command people to worship him, and in order to do that he controlled the money system, and so whoever loves money will worship him, and so forth. It says in verse 32, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupted by flatteries. They'll believe the lie of this Antichrist. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. It's going to cost to go against the world system. The point is, as you look at verse 32 and verse 33, they were the wise ones, weren't they? Because now, rather than turning Christ down for an antichrist who could offer you worldly things, such as money and prosperity and a short, happy time here on earth, some people knew to, to, to believe in the covenant of God, the promises of God, Jesus Christ. And, and now, they are the wise ones. And what's going to happen to them? They're going to shine like the firmament of heaven. They're going to enter into glory with Jesus Christ, into his glorious kingdom. And they that were wise and understood instructed many. They took the time to teach others 
And according to verse 3 then, they that turn many to righteousness as the stars, how long does their reward last for? Forever. They suffered a short time here on earth, but the reward for suffering for the Lord is forever and ever. And, and no wonder it says that they are wise, are going to shine as the firmament. And they that turned, they took the opportunity not only to know the truth and believe the truth, but the ones who took the time to instruct others in the way of truth are going to be rewarded in such a way that, that they're going to be as, they're going to shine as the stars of heaven forever and ever. What I want you to realize in here is that you have within the nation of Israel two kinds of people. Just like we have perhaps in this assembly today, at least we know we have in the world today, two kinds of people. You have the saved and you have the lost. You have those who are going to heaven and those who are going to go to hell. There is no in-between. It's one or the other. Those who have believed on Jesus Christ for everlasting life and those who have rejected Him or neglected Him, it's all the same thing. And so, in, in this case, we're dealing with the nation of Israel and you have those two types of people. Some who knew their God and some who followed the Antichrist. Maybe just neglect, maybe knew the truth but chose to go the wrong way. Whatever, you have the believer and the non-believer. And then you have the wise. And those wise are going to shine as the firmament and as the stars forever and ever. Keep those thoughts in mind and come with me now to the book of Matthew. First of all, I'm going to show you some verses about the many. And I, I know you don't have to do this too much because we've done it... Uh, the other day in a different message, but Matthew chapter 7, first of all. And I'm, what I'm going to do here is just give you some verses to look at and realize how they relate to what Daniel was talking about. A judgment, some wise people, and some shining. Other people in this judgment who weren't not so wise are not going to shine at all. In fact, they're going to suffer damnation at this judgment. In, in Matthew chapter 7, um, verse 22. Start in verse 21. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, now there's a day that Israel realizes there's some accountability. They're going to give an account to Jesus Christ. It's got to be the day He comes back. It says, Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Thy name, and in Thy name cast out devils, and, and in Thy name done many wonderful works? Then I will profess also uh, uh, unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There will be a lot of religious folks who did religious things. And by the way, the Antichrist system is a religious thing. There's going to be a lot of people who did all kinds of religious things and said, Lord, look what we did. And he said, I never knew you. Depart from me. Now, if you're going to depart from Jesus Christ, who's going to come back to reign in glory in his kingdom, then, then to depart then is to be outside of that kingdom outside of the presence of God, outside of the brightness of the glory of that kingdom that's going to be established. And many who think they're okay are not okay because they were just following a religious system and they were not believing the will of God is that you believe on Jesus Christ whom He sent, the book of John tells us. And many are going to ignore Jesus Christ, just follow the religion and think in the religion they're okay. It's not going to work. They're going to be cut out. Come over with me, and the idea there, many are going to say that, it says. And that many, I believe, is the nation of Israel in the time of their special judgment. Um, chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20. It says in verse 16, first of all, it says, So the last shall be first, and the first uh, last, for many are called, but few are chosen. Dennis Nicholas pointed this one out to me as, as he left a couple weeks ago when I just threw out the statement without proving to you that I think that the many is Israel. And he commented on the way out. He said, that explains that verse. How come God doesn't say he called everybody? 
Well, when Jesus Christ came, he came only to the nation of Israel. The call of salvation during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ wasn't to everybody in the world. That came later through Apostle Paul. And so many were called, and that is not everybody in the world, but the nation of Israel exclusively was called in the earthly ministry of Christ. But few were chosen, and that is God only chose to save within the nation of Israel the believing remnant. So as all of Israel was called, but concerning the world, many were called, but only few of those were even chosen. The many definitely refers to the nation of Israel. The same chapter, look at verse 26. It says, uh, it's 28. It says, even so, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus Christ, according to Isaiah chapter 53 and, and uh, verses 11 and 12, came to give his life for the nation of Israel. And, and Jesus Christ came and to give his life a ransom for many. It's not until you come to the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul says that Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom for all. And then the very next verse says, to be testified in due time, whereof I am appointed a minister and an apostle uh, uh, of Jesus Christ and so forth. The Apostle Paul is the one who in due time told the world that Christ gave himself a ransom for all. But when you come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you only have recorded here the ministry of Jesus Christ to the nation of Israel because of their privileged, special position that they have at this time before the age of grace. And when Jesus Christ was talking about giving himself his life, it was at that time a ransom for many because the nation of Israel was who he had in mind. It wasn't everybody at this time. Later, we're told that it was for everybody. But the many is definitely the nation of Israel. And that's the same reason for Matthew chapter 26. Come over there. I'll keep you in Matthew. It'll make things easy. Matthew chapter 26, and look at verse 27. He took the cup, the communion cup, and gave thanks, and, uh, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, "Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the new testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins." Now we not only know that this says again, "many for the remission of sins," as if he's going to shed his blood at Calvary for only many people, not for all people. The Apostle Paul tells us in First Timothy chapter four and was it verse 10 through 12 there, that, that Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men, especially they that believe. The, but here, when Jesus Christ talks about giving his life, he's doing it for many, for the remission of many people's sins, not the remission of everybody's sins. But he sa he's saying that many in light of the nation of Israel, and we know that because it also says that this is the blood of the New Testament. The New Testament is the new covenant that the Old Testament promised for the nation of Israel, that God would make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. We know that what, what is in, in, in the mind and in the words of the Lord Jesus Christ at this point is His promises and fulfilling His promises to the nation of Israel. And if it wasn't for the Apostle Paul, we wouldn't know that these things were also accomplished for us. But now we do know that. But they had the special privilege and they had the special, they had Christ came to them and, and, and they turned him down. He came and, and unto his own, and his own received him not. But to those that did, he gave the power uh, to become sons of God. Now, so we're learning that here. Now come back with me uh, to Matthew chapter 7. Just some facts that we'll put together before we study the judgment. The end of the Sermon on the Mount... The Lord Jesus Christ says in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 7, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which builds his house upon a rock. There's no doubt that the Lord Jesus Christ is that rock. He is the rock of the profession that Peter made, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And whoever believes that message in the kingdom program is going to enter into eternal life. Uh, Jesus Christ likens him unto a wise man. Aren't we studying a wise man in Daniel chapter 12 there? Those who were wise, knew God, were wise, instructed many. Those who are wise are going to shine, right? Christ says that, uh, that the person who hears his words and does what he says will be likened unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock and the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which builds his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. You know how great? Those who are wise are going to be raised unto everlasting life, and those who are unwise, did not believe the truth, built their their house on sand, are going to be raised to everlasting shame and contempt. And, and so it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority. <laughs> he did. He's the judge <laughs> and not as the scribes. He knew what he was talking about and shared with great authority what it was going to be that, that Israel had to do and hear and believe in order to, to come out wise and shine his lights in the end. Matthew chapter 8. Come over chapter 8 with me. Verse 11 says, I say unto you that many shall come from the east and from the west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, for thou, uh, as thou hast believed, so be it unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Verses 11 and 12 tell you that when Jesus Christ comes and sets up his kingdom with the nation of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're with him. Resurrection is going to take place. But there's a judgment that's implied in there too. Because while some Gentiles are going to be invited to go into the kingdom with the nation of Israel that's been promised to the nation of Israel, some of the children of the kingdom are not going to go in, are they? They're going to be cast out of the kingdom and to be out of that kingdom, outside that kingdom, it described it as being cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Some of the children of the kingdom, the nation of Israel, to whom these promises were made, some of them aren't going in. Some of them are going to be cast out into outer darkness on the other side of that kingdom. Come over to to chapter 22 again. Christ comes back and they're having a festival. The kingdom has begun. And there's a certain man there found without a wedding garment on. And he said in verse 12, Matthew 22, verse 12, And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And, And the king said unto his servant, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Here's a man there in his own garments, not the garments of righteousness. Came in, tried to get in apart from Christ, and when Christ saw him, the man is cast out, and when he's cast out, he's cast out into outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many are called, this guy wasn't. Uh, He was called, but he's not chosen because he didn't come the way he was called to come and that is through Jesus Christ. And so you see all of that. Now, if you come with me to Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24 parallels everything we've studied in Daniel chapter 10 and 11 up to where we are in chapter 12 and does parallel the judgment of chapter 12 as we're going to see. What happens in Matthew chapter 24 is all about the signs that precede the coming of Christ Then it describes the tribulation period in a very brief way, the seven years of God's judgment that's going to be poured upon this earth before Christ returns. And then Christ comes immediately when it's over. It says, uh, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall shall not give her light, the stars uh, shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. 
Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they, as, uh, as they, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He shall send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and shall gather together His elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. The nation of Israel is gathered together. That's who His elect is in the Old Testament before God reached out and elected to save Jews and Gentiles alike apart from the nation of Israel. But through the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was God's elect nation. Jesus Christ returns and here the angels go and gather all Israel. Now apparently that when they're being gathered, there's going to be a final judgment that's first conducted on them. When you come to the later part of Matthew chapter 24, what you have is you have the warnings of what it's going to be like when Christ comes. It says that it's going to be like at the days of Noah. Uh, the days of Noah, you know, two would be in the middle, one would be taken, the other left. Uh, Noah's day, judgment came because people didn't believe the judgment was coming. It came suddenly when they didn't expect it. And the ones who got saved to stay was Noah and his family. And the other ones who got taken away were the ones who were taken away in the floods of judgment when it came through. There's going to be a flood of judgment when Jesus Christ comes back. And the point of that is to be ready for His return. The nation of Israel who were given the oracles of God, the promises of God, if anybody on this earth would be ready for their Messiah to come, Israel should be. They had the signs they were given. And they had the Word of God they were given. They should be looking not only for His first coming, but now since that's passed, they ought to be the ones who are looking for His second coming. So it says in verse 44, Matthew 24, 44, Therefore be ye, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now he's going to come. Now I, I always wonder if there's not a special law at the end of the tribulation that makes people think that, oh hey, the judgment, what happened? Isn't he coming back? I'm not exactly sure what takes place, but... Somehow in the tribulation period, something happens where the nation of Israel no longer could, might think that Christ isn't going to come back. And the warning is, is be ready, don't you be fooled, you better not give up thinking about Him coming back, He's coming. Verse 45 says, who then is a faithful and what? Wise servant. Know this, that the servant of God in the Old Testament is the nation of Israel. The Jehovah Witnesses who like to steal that name and say they are Jehovah Witnesses. Get that from Isaiah, was it chapter 43, where, Isaiah, where the prophet Isaiah, speaking for the Lord, says to the nation of Israel, Ye are my witnesses and my servants, saith Jehovah. So they say, oh, we're Jehovah Witnesses. That's where they get the name. But what God is speaking to is the nation of Israel. They were His servants on the earth to make His name known. When it, when it talks about a faithful servant in verse 45, you're talking about the nation of Israel being judged at Christ's coming. And one who is going to be judged faithful is a wise servant. And notice what makes him wise. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom the Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them their meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. So doing what? Feeding the people, standing faithful, ready for Christ to come back. The nation of Israel had these promises. He's coming back for them. He's coming back to save them, coming back to give them the kingdom. A faithful servant's going to be ready, going to be waiting, going to be talking about that kingdom. And so the, the, he's going to be blessed when the Lord comes back. Resurrection unto life. But it says in verse 48, uh, Oh, verse 47, Verily I say unto you, he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But if he say, but if that evil servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, ah, the Lord's not coming back, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and to drink with the drunkard, the Lord of that servant shall come in the day when he looketh not for him in an hour that he is not aware of. He's thinking the Lord's not coming back. And he shall cut him asunder and shall appoint his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
You see, when the Lord comes back, Israel, who knew to look for Him more than any other nation, He was coming back to the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel who were not looking. And in their heart says, nah, He's not coming back. And they're not looking for Him. He comes back. The ones who looked, believed, and were looking for Him, and they're going to rule. The ones who were not looking for Him, that person, according to this verse, is, is taken and he's, he's cast out. It says, cut him asunder. He's cut out of the kingdom. Cut away from the nation of Israel. His portion is po- pointed with Him with the hypocrites. Everlasting contempt. Those who, like the heathen who knew not God, He's going to be cut off with Him. We come to chapter 25, and it says, Then all the, uh, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. And uh, it says, They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their lamps, uh, and, and excuse me, in their vessels with their lamps, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. They're all asleep. You know, the whole point of this is Jesus Christ is ready to go to Calvary, and what He's teaching the nation of Israel is there's going to be a delay in my return. But just because there's a delay, don't think that I'm not coming back. Because if you do, you're going to be a wicked servant, and you're going to be cut out of the kingdom. You who know and have the promises and are waiting for it and believe in it, You're going to go in. You're going to be either wise or you're going to be foolish. Now here, they're they're described as virgins. All five are virgins. Or all ten are virgins. All ten are pure. But only five of them took oil with their lamp. Because oil, it is symbolic in the Bible of the Holy Spirit, which was promised to the nation of Israel. What it is, it's you have... You have ten people that have kept themselves pure from the worldly system. They did it through the the religion that they were given. But five of them didn't do it through the religion that they were given. Five of them did it through the Lord and received the Holy Spirit. Five of them are also rejecting the Antichrist system. They're saying they're part of the believing remnant of Israel, but never came the way of Christ. They don't have the Holy Spirit. But they're just as pure as the other ones because they didn't touch the world system. But as they wait, and that's what happens, as as the, the second coming of Jesus Christ is delayed, it becomes obvious what's in the heart of the person. And what happens is in this parable is that Jesus Christ comes back, and when he wakes up, they hear the announcement he's coming. The foolish, their lamps went out. They have no light. And then they tried to get light from someone else, but you can't get light from someone else, so they went off to get some light. And as they're off getting the light, it says in verse 10, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him unto the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterwards, the others also, other virgin, uh, the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. Lord, Lord, many are going to say that to him. What, what is he going to answer? And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know not the day or the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Now, the next one, and we're going to cover this fast. It says in verse 14, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man traveling into a far country who called his servants and delivered unto them his goods. The Lord Jesus Christ calls the nation of Israel unto himself, says, I'm going back to heaven. I'm going to be gone for a long time. Tarry till I come back. But he gives them something. He doesn't just leave them without anything. Verse 15, he says unto, uh, and unto the one he gave five talents and to the other two, and to another uh, one, to every one according to his several ability, and straightway he took his journey. Now, he's leaving, but he imparts to them what they need. Now, the talent here is money. We're talking about money in this case. But what it is, is he gives them what's necessary for them to abide until he comes back. He left them something. And, 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 and when he left him something, he gave different abilities, or different, not ability, he gave different amounts uh, to different people based on their ability. So he didn't give anybody an assignment to do that they weren't capable of doing. That's the point. Then he goes away. He comes back, and the one who had five had produced five more talents, 
And he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joy of the Lord. You're wise. Goes the other one ahead too. He says, enter ye into the, into the joy of the Lord. He comes to the one that only had one talent. And you read this in verse 23. Uh, verse 24. Then he, then he which had received one talent came, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou, thou hast not strewn. I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth, and lo, there was there, uh, there thou hast that is thine. And the Lord said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, you lazy man. But this man isn't just lazy. There's a neglect here. This man is saying, I knew what kind of man you were, and he knew nothing about the Lord. The Lord proves that by saying, going on to say, if you knew that I was that type of person, why didn't you put the money in the bank and at least gain some interest? Why did you bury it? The point is to this man, you never knew me at all. And when I called you, you just pretended to go along. And when I, when I, when I, when I gave the abilities, you just buried it. You had nothing to do with it. Now I come back and you got this wild excuse that you were afraid and therefore you did it. He said, no, you didn't know me at all. He took away the one from that man and delivered it to the guy who had five. And it says in verse 30, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? This man never knew the Lord. This man neglected to know who Jesus Christ was. Neglected to realize he's coming back and there's an accountability to him when he comes back because he had this special position to be God's people on the earth who were supposed to be God's spokesman on the earth. He took that and he just buried it, thought it to be nothing. And then Jesus Christ comes back and he's called an unprofitable servant. And he's cast into outer darkness. I see this as being the judgment upon the nation of Israel at the return of Christ. When Christ comes back within the nation of Israel, many are going to be raised unto everlasting life. Enter ye into the joy of the Lord. They're going to enter into the light of the kingdom and they're going to shine as lights. But there's a lot within the nation of Israel who never knew the Lord, never received and believed in the promises that were given them and never did what God called them for. And there are the unprofitable servant going to be cast into outer darkness. Now I share all this and I, I say that scares me to think. When I read this passage, I get afraid. You ought to get afraid about this passage. Because you ought to think to yourself, is this my judgment? And if I'm not doing something and haven't produced something for the Lord, am I going to get cast into hell? The passage would seem to teach that, wouldn't it? If you're honest with Scripture, it teaches that. But you know what there is not here? There's not the grace of God. The Bible says today that we're saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And you know, every time Paul puts a benediction on the end of his chapters, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you. You know, we're saved by grace. We're kept by grace. We ought to be motivated by grace. But I thank God for the grace of God because if it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd have to face this kind of judgment. But... Not only do I not have to face this kind of judgment, I'm not these servants. That's why I don't have to face that. I didn't have these special privileges that were given to them. I didn't have these special promises that were given. They're going to be judged according to what God gave them, every one, every several ability as He gave. But you know what I do have to account for? God gave me grace. And I'm going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ one day, and He's going to ask me, did my grace motivate you? to do what Israel under the law wasn't motivated to do. When my grace was a higher standard and a higher calling, and I am going to give an account. I thank God by His grace I'm going to heaven no matter what the outcome of that judgment seat of Christ is concerned. I'm saved and sealed unto the day of redemption. But you know, when I read about this, I begin to understand that you and I, the nation of Israel, has a special accountability that they're going to be given in that last day, and that scares me. Because it scares me to realize that I live in an age of grace. It's a very special age. And I have a special accountability that I'm going to have to give. Number one, have you neglected to receive the grace of God? Like Israel neglected to receive the promises of God. If you haven't received the grace of God, you need to put your faith that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. You need to put your faith in that message. Believe it and be saved according to the Bible. But after that, the grace of God working in your life, are you letting it work? 
Are you letting the Holy Spirit produce fruit? You're going to give an account, every one of us. And we're going to give an account that the Bible says whether good or bad. You're going to give an account. And it's time that we realize that, that God is real. Jesus Christ is really coming back. He really is going to save us by his grace. But he asks you, how did you handle my grace? What did you do with grace? Did you use it to grow in grace? Or did you use it to live a sinful life? And you'll give an answer. Hopefully you don't try to make up an excuse like this man. Let's pray. try to make clear, if your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, that we're talking about a special judgment to Israel because of special privileges. The message to God of God to you is not that you're a special person, it's that you're a lost sinner, but that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all your sins. Believe on him as your Savior, and you'll be saved. You trust your own righteousness, you'll go to hell. You follow a church system, you'll go to hell. You believe in your own goodness, you'll go to hell. You believe on Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. That's what God in his grace wants you to do. So if the gospel hasn't been clear, may it be clear now, trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Heavenly Father, we don't know how to put everything in your Bible and in proper perspective because both sides do show up. Your great love and provision of salvation, the great joy and light and life of, of eternity with you, but Father, there's great wrath and contempt and anguish and judgment against those who have rejected you, 